Hello, I'm Christian Patson and I'm part of the Grand Ambition team here at Swansea Grand Theatre. Now, here in the theatre next week, from the 9th until the 14th, I believe, we've got the Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's an iconic show, it's a brilliant show. If you haven't seen it, don't let this one pass you by. And today, Steve Barsar and myself, we caught up with one of the stars of the show, a Mr. Stephen Webb, who told us what it was like to step into the shoes of Tim Curry. Well, I put my own spin on it. You know, when uh, I got offered the role, um, uh, the director, Christopher Luscombe, he said, look, we don't want you to copy uh, Tim Curry because he's so iconic to the role. So I've had to make my own version, which seems to go down a treat, really. Um, I think it's a little bit more refreshing and a bit more up with the time. So I play him a little bit more, like even my accent, he didn't want me, because I was going to do it in an English accent and he didn't want me to do it in an English accent because people will compare. So that's why I do him as a slight, American Southern twang, you know, a bit more, a, a bit more broader, you know, to, to, and it seems to work, you know, um, and that's what I love about it. You know, Rocky Horror, when I got offered it, I thought there's no way I'm going to be able to play this role, you know, and I went in there in the audition, put on a pair of heels, put on like a vest and some tight jeans on, and they asked me to sing Sweet Transvestite, and I went in there, took all my clothes off, I went on the panel and flirted with all the panel and it seemed to do the job. <laughs> it's what I've been doing for years. And I think Steve will agree. <laughs> Listen, yeah. having been half naked on stage once in my life, how do you, how, how, does, how does that feel? Um, well, first of all, putting on, obviously he doesn't wear much. All he wears is a corset and some fishnet tights. Um, I felt, first of all, like a pig in the blanket, pig in blanket, you know, um, <laughs> but... Uh, now I absolutely love it. I feel very empowering. You know, when I go on stage, I'm six foot two, you know, with big hair, and he wears a cloak when he comes out and, uh, on his opening number, walks down, throws his cloak, o cloak off, and uh, people go mad for it, and they, I feel like a Mick Jagger. <laughs> you know, so, it surprises me to hear you say that, um, you know, it's not a role that you saw yourself play, because we first worked together back in 2007, when we did Guy yeah. Falls together. And it was obvious to me that you had a massive career ahead of you in musical theatre, because you were just sensational to work with and be around. And that oh, voice is, is, is just incredible. So I can see you in any role, and I definitely can see you in the Frankenfurter role. Would you have said you were more of a Eddie, perhaps? I thought when I was going to audition for it, my agent said I got, an, got you an audition. I thought that I was going to go up for Brad. Yeah. Or, or, or Eddie, of course. Dr. Scott, yeah. you know, but um, they said, no, we, we saw, you, saw you as Frank and they wanted to do a different twist with Frank because they had had an awful lot of names doing it before, um, you know, and, and obviously d different, different genre, you know, like uh, uh, people with different sexes, you know, like I'm a, I'm a straight man playing it where I know the past decade it's been majority it's been a gay man playing it so I thought in my head they'll, they'll never see me for, for, for this role and um, obviously I when I first did it I, I did the tour in 2018 and 19 and I was sharing it with Duncan James so I was coming in backwards and forwards and um, that was great and then when during lockdown they phoned me up and said do you want to do it again i do you know what I mean? I grabbed at the chance to do it. And um, I'm always learning with the role. That's the only thing with Frank is that he's not, he's quite a complicated character, you know, and it's quite, you can get very self-indulgent with him. But what I love about him is, is that every single night there's, because obviously people that don't know Rocky Horror, they shout out, there is a script and they are part of the show. So every night you just don't know what you're going to get. You either will get a really leery crowd or you'll get, uh, a really obnoxious crowd that like sometimes you have to really control them and that's what I love about it I love the fact that I don't know what I'm going to get out there and and um and I just f for me I, th I find it very rewarding to do a part that I've been nearly doing for nearly two years and I still love it I yeah. really do and it's got to yeah. be one of the best jobs I've ever done in my life that's another thing I was going to ask you actually because the first time I ever saw Rocky Horror was here in the Swansea Grand Theatre, which of course you'll be here next week with all the team. Um, and I knew nothing about it. I must have been about 17 years old. 
<laughs> a friend of mine booked front row seats to see it. Um, yeah. And he said, I'll be back. He had a little carrier bag with him. He said, we were in the front row. I'll be back in a minute. He was on about going, we've got to go early, got to go early. Well, okay, fine. He said, be back in a minute. And he went off and he came back and he had stockings and suspenders and, and a bag. <laughs> and I thought, what's going on here? Yeah. And he said, look behind you. And when I turned round, <laughs> I was in a suit and I was the odd one out. <laughs> That's the, do you know what I think? I think doing this show, I think I've seen everything now. I've pretty much seen, you know, uh, people just wearing nipple tassels and a thong. That's how that, that's how much I've seen. You know, that, which I think we call that Sunday in our house. <laughs> <laughs> and I love it. I love that people. Like, what other show is there out there that people can get up, um, come and see a show, get dressed up? and have a real good time for the next two hours. I know that theatre itself anyway, that never normally breaks the full floor, unless you're doing pantomime, you know, but with this show, we encourage it. We encourage people to, to be part of the show and they feel like they're part of the show. And that's why people keep coming back. You know, it's been going on for 50 years and next year it's the, it's the 50th anniversary and um, it, see, it still seems to be very current. And during lockdown and everything, we're still very busy. You know, people want to come. People yeah. want to come see it, you know. So, you know, I'm very fortunate in this position to be doing to doing it. And, um, yeah. yeah. And they're, very, they're very lucky to have you. And, and, and you say about not breaking the fourth wall, but there's another story for you as well. Stephen was in a tour of uh, The Wedded Singer with uh, a mutual friend of ours, Johnny Wilkes. Yeah. <laughs> and Stephen is a giggler, and so am I. And Stephen apologised to the audience one night because you were laughing. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. and that was in Stoke. That was in Stoke. Basically, they bought... So I played this um, yuppie type of 80s, you know, very rich man, um, and was trying to offer Jonathan Wilkes a job. Anyway, in the show, they get they bought, a, like, first edition Motorola. It had, a, it had a, like, um, a, a battery that size of a brick. So anyway, they said... Please don't drop it because it's worth around about six, seven hundred pounds. I went, don't worry, I'm safe hands, you're fine. So anyway, got one on stage, dropped it, and it smashed to pieces. Oh. Well, obviously, I couldn't stop laughing. So that, and it was my opening number. So during the song, I'm trying to trying to sing. And in the end, I, I got so hysterical, didn't you? And I apologized to the audience. <laughs> I always thought, this is it. This is press night. I thought, this is it. They're going to pan me. I still want a good review. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, they would have loved that. Having been on that stage for 15 years, they would have absolutely loved that. They would have loved yeah. watching a person struggle to keep it together. Yeah. Now, Steve, of course, <laughs> share a part in common as well. So I've just found out, Stephen, we were both yes. in Notre Dame de Paris. How was, it? was. How was it for you? How was it for you? Uh, well, it was an experience. You know, I, um, ah, yeah. do you know what? I loved, I loved the music. Um, and I don't know if it was the same with you, but obviously we, we never had a live orchestra on stage. No. We had to do it um, in in-ears. So everything was on click. So performing at that time, I know now, modern theatre, you know, and I know six, they have in-ears. Um, but... Um, it was really weird to sing, you know, without, uh, with not having a live band and having, and I didn't, I felt like I wasn't connected with the crowd. But what I, what I loved about it, I loved the spectacle of it because you had the singers, you yeah. had the dancers, you had the acrobats and everything. And I loved my costume. Like you must have had that chain, that big, that, 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 that must have weighed about 10 kilos. Yeah. That was heavy. Running around singing torn apart was one of the most hardest things I've ever done. <laughs> it was a workout. It was, and it was a it was a musical of key changes. Like I think torn apart had about four key changes in it. Um, and I absolutely loved the music. That's why I wanted to do it. I wanted to work with that creative team. But working with a creative team that the way the way British performers, they want to find out why they sing, why they're running over that side or why they're singing that song. And with, um, I can't remember the direct, director's name. However, Gilles Mau. That's it. Uh, he, he approached everything like an opera. So it was more of, of the fact that you had to like project with your body and everything. And I was like, this is really weird. Why? I said, why don't you just tell me? And obviously because he was half French, because he was French and he spoke very, broken English, 
I had to just try and read between the lines. Anyway, when we got to, we opened in China and then we moved over to South Korea. And when we got to this theatre, it was a massive amphitheatre. It was around about four, four, five, four, four and a half thousand seater. And I was like, ah, right, I get what he means now. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. it's so big, like you did it at Dominion, which again is a massive venue. So oh, I understood man. you had to... and. When I saw the piece and how it was lit, because I know that Torn Apart, you have three contemporary dancers dancing with a spotlight on them, and it can only be on for like a couple of moments, and then they'll and then it'll go black. Um, and so when I saw it from from that point of view, I was like, ah, I understand what what he means, you know. And also, we're performing it in English to a Chinese or a Korean crowd, and so to interpret it you had to interpret it in your own body language. So that's what I, I understood. And I, I enjoyed it. I, I did enjoy it. Like, I only did six shows out of the eight. I had an alternate for, for two of them. I thought, this is great, you know. Yeah. But um, I'll tell you it what, was good I'll, to see. I'll tell you a quick story about, so I was part of the original British cast or the, or yeah. the English speaking cast. So they had all the big stars and we had a guy called Garou and- um, Yeah. Daniel Lavoie and all these people who, who played. You had it. Tina Arena as well, didn't you? Tina came, she was amazing. Yeah. So my agent at the time, Johnny and myself, we were invited down to Medem, which is a big um, expo down in Cannes. It's been going for years and they were going to do the press launch there. And we were on to them all the time. And I was signed to Sony Records at the time and, and Sony was promoting the album and Selena done the, the big song and it was a big old thing. And uh, they needed it to work in the UK for it to go and tour the rest of the world, right? So it was a lot at stake. So I kept going, can I have the music? Can I have the music in English? Can I have the music in English? Can I have the lyrics? And they were like, yeah, we'll send this to you. We'll send this to you. It never came. So they invited me down to meet and they said, it's just going to be a press launch. And I was like, okay, okay, no problem. So Johnny and I got hammered on the plane down, laughing and joking. And Johnny said, oh, you'll be singing it tomorrow. And we were like, Haha, another gin. We got off <laughs> the plane hammered. We get into a car and the, we drove past this massive gig. And the driver said, you play there tomorrow, you play there. And we're like, you what, mate? And when we got there, I was handed the lyrics and I had to learn them overnight to a bunch of songs. <laughs> it was like the worst, you know, the, the nightmare of going on stage and not knowing anything. It yeah. me. And I had to kind of make it up. And it was the lyricist, a guy called Luke Plomondon, who was, who was going, well, you just walk here and you walk here. And I was going, yeah, it was insane. And it was only when we got to got to London, a couple of the cast came and said, we thought you were terrible. <laughs> we thought you were terrible. I was like, give me a break, dude. They said, you're better now, but we thought you were terrible out there. I was like, oh, oh no. <laughs> it was, it was brutal. Stephen, uh, off stage antics, um, what goes on backstage? Not that you get much time backstage, but what goes on backstage? I'm thinking about when we were in the Edinburgh Playhouse, you may not remember this. Um, and with people like uh, Andy and Josh and um, all those sorts of people. And they were so bored, these lads. <laughs> so honest to God, they were so bored. We'd been doing it for ages by that time um, that uh, they decided to lay on their backs and light their farts. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah. Do you remember that? yeah, I used to join in. And, 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 <laughs> and one of the, do you remember, <laughs> this is one of the spots of the <laughs> team said, I wouldn't do that if I were you. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I heard a story once about the fart going inwards and the bloke exploded. Well, we were. <laughs> he, he told us that and we were literally wetting ourselves. I remember it, oh. oh, of course I did. Because I was the one on the floor trying to light the farts. Yeah, of course you were. Of course you were. And, and there'd be like little blue flames shooting. At, so backstage antics at uh, backstage antics at. Rocky Horror then, anything got on that we can... Uh, oh, uh, can I... Um, backstage antics. Well, the majority of myself, are, I'm kind of by myself. Even though I'm... When I'm on stage, I'm, it's the only time I actually get to see anyone. So me having any backstage antics, it's not really... that I haven't had an awful lot. I know it sounds really weird, you know, and... Um, this sounds really boring, but I, I don't really. I don't have any backstage antics. You, you know, I into the. You never walked into the wings to see other cast members trying to light their farts or anything. <laughs> no, no. It's really, it's really sad, really, because I wish I did. Because I, you know, 
you know, normally, because you know that when you're on tour, you're a family and mm. you're, you're with each other all the time. Mm. And the only time I get to see the cast is at warm up. Mm. And then afterwards, I don't come on till 20 minutes in. So everyone's already, you know, been congregated together. And, and then when I come on, I'm on stage and then I'm kind of with everyone, but I'm kind of by myself, you know, and that happens all the way through the show. So when I hear about something, I'm like, Oh, what happened there? Because I, I don't really know what, what's been going on. Well, the only people I it, talk to is my wiggy or my or my dresses. You know, that's yeah. it. <laughs> it's one of the best, it's got to be one of the best entrances in musical theatre yeah. ever. Yeah. Yeah, for yeah, without a doubt. Like I'm I must admit, I've done there's a handful of shows that I've done that I've gone, that's that's on my top, you know, like was was guys and dolls, Jersey Boys. But this, hands down, has got to be one of my favourites. And coming out, and they play a vamp, because you know it's you know they just play like a, a vamp before he comes out. And the audience go crazy for it. And then they open the doors, and there's smoke, and there's lights and everything. Like, our, our set is not big, but it's a costume and lighting show. So, mm. and I think that they've done a fantastic job of that. And um, when he comes out, and he's in a cloak, and he whips it off, and you just see him in his whole get up, people just go crazy. And, 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 that, and that's what I love about it. And you, I, um, uh, I've i tried to nick my costume, you know, last time, but <laughs> I'm not allowed to have it. <laughs> Who else is gonna wear it after you've worn it? Well, this is it. It was made for me, you it's know. Okay. Um, I just, do you know what? The costumes, cause like I have three corsets in the show. And I thought that a corset it costs a couple hundred quid, do you know what I mean? But it doesn't. They actually, the way it's made, it's all got like Shabosky crystals on it and it's um, made for me. But it's everything in the show is slightly a wonk. Nothing's ever perfect. Like, even with my makeup, um, the, uh, when, I, when I first got off the role, I thought I was going to have someone doing my makeup for me because when I saw Tim Curry do I thought his makeup looked pristine. I went, yeah, but that was for the movie. He said when he actually did it, you know, in uh, in the theatre, it was literally like a bloke nicking his mum's purse and putting his makeup on. You know, it's supposed to be a little bit rough around the edges. So I had to, that was the thing that was giving me anxiety, going, oh, my God, never put makeup in my life on before and trying to, trying to do it. And, I, you know, from a distance, I look all right, you know. <laughs> Maybe not say. so far close. Uh, uh, on the um, on the little bits of uh, poster and uh, little bits of um, press that you've done, and I've seen you, I've thought he looks great. He looks absolutely amazing. Well, that's me. That is. That I, <laughs> no, I honestly thought, oh, he's got somebody doing his makeup. So to hear no. you is is very impressive. And as you know, I yeah. put on every Christmas. <laughs> yeah, I know you do. I know you do. And you look gorgeous. I know you bad words. Uh, <laughs> but the, I know the designer said to me, you're not a drag queen, you're a transvestite. And, and the whole point is that he's picked things that he's seen on. Obviously, he's an alien. He's from a planet called Transsexual. He's come to planet Earth. So he's, he's a lot of our show is set in B movies, you know, of the like uh, horror B movies, you know, Frankenstein, Close Encounters. So he's called himself Frankenfurter, mostly because he's seen Frankenstein, you know, and, and um, uh, he's seen things on, on TV that, oh, I love that. I love that. And he's like cut things and it's kind of a little bit off, you know, everything that he has. It's like his hair is not perfect. It's a little bit like he's been in bed with someone and it's a little bit disheveled, you know, and that's how we approach it. You know, it's, we're not squeaky clean. We're a bit rough, rough around the edges, you know, and I like that because um, I can never be pristine anyway, you know, so, um, uh, so Has yeah. Has yeah. been in to see it, Steve? I was, I was about to ask Has that. Richard O'Brien been in to see it? Do you know what, Richard, I met Richard O'Brien on the first tour and I remember auditioning for it and I hadn't even been told that I got offered the role. And he said, oh, Richard O'Brien wants to meet you. They filmed me in, in the uh, audition room. So anyway, I went to meet him in Common Garden. Anyway, there was a couple of us. There was a guy playing, Brad and Janet and myself, went to go and meet him. Um, and he was just over because I think he was promoting a new show. Uh, and anyway, uh, he said, oh, hi, nice to meet you. And I said, oh, hi, I'm Stephen. I'm, uh, I'm up for Frankenfurt. And he grabbed me by the hand, took me down the pub, 
and told me everything about Frank. And obviously Frank for him was his alter ego. Realistically, that that's who that 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 that's uh, Richard O'Brien, and um, he was such a generous man. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that because I'm staying on the tour, I'm staying it for, for the fiftieth. Uh, we're going into Amazing. London with it. Wow. Yeah, so I'm I'm in it till uh, the the following year, and um, I'm hoping that he comes over. You know, but but my Richard now is in his eighties now. He had his eightieth birthday th this year, so. Um, I'm hoping that he does come over. You know, he lives in uh, New Zealand. Um, but because of COVID, I think it's all been a bit, you know, he hasn't been able to come over this year. But he was a very humble, generous man who told me an awful lot about him. And, um, yeah, it was uh, it was great. But I still didn't know that I had the role until I got the call the next day. And they went, yeah, he liked you. You're fine. <laughs> I can't was... imagine... Can't imagine anyone not liking you, Stephen. You're a you're a you're a top bloke. Uh, listen, oh, we won't thanks. take up too much too much more of your time now because I know you, you know you're very busy and stuff. And we're really grateful to have the chance to speak to you. Uh, but my you're pleasure. Here next week at the Grand Theatre in Swansea. Have you played Hi. Swansea before? Do you know what? I was actually thinking when the last time. And I think it was over 15, 16 years ago. It was the first time. I I got my first big professional job and we went to Swansea Grand. So I'm looking forward oh. to going there. And I'm looking forward to actually going to the Mumbles again. Yeah. You know, and, yeah. You know I, I can't I can't wait. So, um, yeah, it'll be great to see you. And it's great to talk to actually, Stephen, you're actually one of my fellow, like, heroes of mine. You know, I used to look up Thanks. to you when I was growing up. Oh. Yeah, oh, I really did. Like, I loved you in Jesus Christ Superstar. I used to listen to your album all the time, trying to sing your falsetto notes. Not a chance. <laughs> <laughs> but you are, to me, the definitive, you know, best Jesus I think they ever had. It's been a real joy and a real pleasure catching up with you. Um, My pleasure. We look forward to welcoming you back to the Swansea Grand. And, uh, yeah, anyone watching on the Grand Ambition channel or on the Grand Theatre channel, and we'll post it live on to Twitter, and Stephen hopefully will retweet it, and Steve will, I will. Um, come down, see the show. It is one of the best shows you can see with your clothes on or off. <laughs> and you are, I think it's fair to say, you are as much a part of the show as the people on stage. So, Stephen Webb, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Lots of love. Bye-bye. <laughs>